All right. Let's get started. Um, so I don't have much in the way of super big announcements. I uh, graded uh, homework 8.1. Uh, that was the one on CB. Uh, really, everybody did fine. It was just minor calculation errors. Um, that was it. There's really not a whole lot to say. Uh, 8.2 is due, uh, and you're going to get 8.3 uh, here in a little bit. We're going to get right into it with discreetly braced uh, analysis. I really want to make sure that we have a lot of time to go through the calculations. So I kind of just want to jump right in. Um, let's start off with this, because this is arguably the most important slide, uh, one of the most important slides for the rest of the semester. Um, I did add something to this. If you look at zone three, on the FCR formula, I put a little bubble at the bottom that says C equals 1. I didn't do that on the, the last slide, uh, but C equals 1 for all W shapes, so th there won't be anything that you need to look up. I just wanted to include that there so that we have it. But um, but let's just sort of lay it out and make sure that we're all clear on, on what's going on here. So what this uh, flow chart does is illustrate to uh, to you as the student and to really anybody, um, how to determine the flexural capacity of a W shape um, based on its unbraced length. So what we do is we compare its unbraced length to the two anchor points LP and LR, and then that tells us whether or not we're in zone one, zone two, or zone three. Now, if we're in zone one, the flexural capacity is just MP, just the plastic moment. Uh, if it's in zone two, we use linear interpolation between MP and MR. Uh, remember that BF term, that's the slope of that line. Uh, and zone three, we use the elastic uh, uh, solution to our differential equation that we came up with earlier. It's just been reformatted a bit uh, uh, with this FCR term. Now with zone two and zone three, our capacity is always taken as the minimum of whatever we compute and MP because MP uh, is always the maximum, is always the maximum term. And then I also included the equation for CB uh, in the top right. So that right there is, in a nutshell, how we compute the flexural capacity of a discreetly braced beam right here. And so I just want to get into it. Um, I have two examples for us today. Uh, one of them is uh, a, a little bit more... Uh, comprehensive where we sort of do everything and the second example is just looking at uh, another calculation um, so let's just get into example one and just just start chucking um, we're going to determine if this beam shown has adequate moment capacity adequate shear capacity and if it meets a live load deflection limit of L over 360 um, the beam is 30 foot long it is a W24 by 76 uh, it is 50 KSI steel the dead load that's shown includes the beam self weight, so we're not going to worry about, about adding the 76 pounds per foot on top of the dead load. It has a dead load of 1.25 kips per foot and a live load of 3 kips per foot. Okay, now, first question I want to ask, and I'm asking Chad, what is LB for this beam? LB. Fifteen. Fifteen feet. Okay. LB is fifteen feet. Okay. The beam itself is thirty foot long, but LB is fifteen. And so that's one of the first things I want everybody to be able to identify is that unbraced length. Okay. Now, I also want to note with this uh, this note here on the bottom, since the beam is symmetric with respect to the loading, the geometry, and the bracing, we only need to evaluate one segment, because if we look at the segment on the left, the segment on the right is going to look exactly the same. Uh, and then I have a note here after this where we'll talk about what happens if that isn't the case. But in most of our situations, that's going to be the case, and we'll be able to identify which segment we need to look at. Uh, so, so with that, I'm just going to jump right into it. Let me uh, share my notebook. Okay, so here's the problem. Oh, go away. Um, here's the problem. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is some structural analysis. So uh, let's uh, let's draw a couple things out. So we know that the dead load is 1.25 Q 
Kemp's per foot. We know that the live load is three kips per foot. And we know that the length of the beam is 30 foot. We know that L sub B is 15 foot. Okay, so they're different terms. Make sure that you're clear on that. Okay, so let's do some structural analysis. And mainly, I'm just looking at moment and shear. We'll look at deflections at the very end. So I'm going to compute a dead load moment, which is WDL squared over 8. So um, 1.25 kips per foot times 30 foot squared over 8. And that's going to come out to be 140.63 foot kips. And then our live load moment is WLL squared over 8. Now, notice I'm just writing down the formula WL squared over 8, and we're using WL squared over 8 because that is the appropriate formula for a simply supported beam and a uniformly distributed load. So hopefully what we did in the last lecture and what you all did on the last homework should clarify that you don't, you don't just full steam ahead with, you know, WL squared over 8. I mean, we can with this problem because it's simply supported and uniformly uh, distributed. But when that's not the case, make sure that you're using the appropriate uh, analysis formula. So this one's three kips per foot, 30 foot squared over eight, um, which is um, 337.5 foot kips. And so from these, we can say MU is 1.2 MD plus 1.6 ml, 1.2 times 140.63 foot kips, plus 1.6 times 337.5 foot kips, and we get an MU of 708.75 foot kips. I'm sort of steaming ahead with this because I'm hoping that by now this stuff is old hat. Um, next we have our shear. So shear uh, is WL over 2. So that's 1.25 kips per foot. 30 foot over 2. Um, and so let's see. That is 18.75 kips. The L is WL over 2, which is 3 kips per foot times 30 foot over 2. So 3 times 30 is 90, divided by 2 is 45. And then VU is 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. Let me scroll that a bit. And that is 94.5 kips. So over here on the right, I'm going to say MU is 708.75 foot kips. And, sorry, VU is 94.5 kips. Let me redo that, 94.5. All right. I just did a lot of writing, so I'm going to give you all a... a quick sec to catch up, um, but as you're catching up, if there's anything, any questions on what I did, let me know, because after this, we're going to get into the actual steel design component. I'll give you all a sec on that.
All right. Um, hopefully that's enough time for everybody to catch up. If you need me to, to scroll back up, let me know. Um, but hopefully, again, this should be pretty, pretty um, old hat at this point. Okay. Now let's get into the new stuff. All right. So let's start off looking at flexural capacity, which is really the superstar uh, of what we're talking about. Again, when I say flexural, that's just a, a fancy word for moment, so moment capacity. So in other words, I'm trying to figure out that. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Now, if you go back to the flow chart, uh, let me – here, I'll pull the flow chart up because um, there's no reason not to. Let's, let's go back to the flow chart. So here's the flow chart, and so this is how we determine flexural capacity. The first thing that we have to do, if you go over here on the left, we have to determine whether or not we're in zone one, zone two, or zone three. Zone three. So that's the first thing we got to do. Okay. So um, in order to do that, we need LP and we need LR. Okay. So let's go back here. Now, if you remember, Table 3.2 mentions, um, it lists a whole bunch of stuff. So that's the ZX tables. It lists a whole bunch of things, including LP and LR. Now, the shape that we're dealing with uh, for this problem, this is a W24 by 76 this problem that's what we're analyzing is a 24 by 76 so what i want y'all to do is i want you to go to the manual i want you to go to table 32 i'm going to grab mine and i want you to tell me what is lp and lr for a 24 by 76 somebody tell me in chat i'm going to get my manual This is important. I want to make sure that you all are comfortable with finding these values. And then don't don't uh, uh, just close your manual because we're going to need that table here in a little bit. All right. LP is 6.78 feet. That's good. All right, and LR is 19.5. That's good. All right, I'm going to just just for um, clarity's sake and to make sure I'm I'm being consistent. Let me. So I found that, or everybody found that, not me, everybody. I uh, found that on page 3-24. Uh, so let me do this. Let me share that. So here's the manual. Uh, for some reason, the manual will have these like orange highlighted regions pop up every now and then. So if that happens, just let me know. So here's the manual. I'm on page 3-24. And if you scroll down to the 24 by 76, it's that bold row there on the bottom. LP and LR, 6.78 19.5. That's exactly right. So back to the notebook. Um, hold on. So back to the notebook, this is um, 6.78 feet. This is 19.5 feet. So if LB was 15 feet, that's what we said before, what zone are we in? Zone 1, zone 2, or zone 3? Zone 1. Zone two, exactly right. 
Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to screen capture the chart because I don't want everybody to feel like they have to keep flipping back and forth. Uh, so I'm going to screen capture the, the flow chart for that region. So, oh, I need to do that here. Sorry. So that's the flow chart right there. And so what does that say? So uh, LP is or LB is between LP and LR, so we're in zone two. So we need a few values, okay? So let's see what we can determine, okay? Now everybody should have their table uh, three, two open. So let's see what's listed in table three, two. Uh, first off, whoops, get my, my black pen back up. So first off, uh, fee MP should be listed. What is fee MP? I'm confused as to why we're in zone two. Okay, so, well, pro probably because I have a little bit of a typo here. Um, this is supposed, this is what happens when you rush your notes. This is supposed to be LP and that's supposed to be LB. Um, but look, the real reason is this and this. Uh, our LB is between those two values. So I'll fix that and re-upload on both sets of notes. Yeah, that's a typo on my part. That's what happens when you're rushing to get notes done. But it's between LP and LR. Now, somebody tell me uh, what's VMP? Seven, okay, 750. I already see it. 750, and at 750, make sure you got the units. That's foot kits. We also need from this table, we need VBF. Our beam factor. What's the beam factor? And the units. I want the units too. There we go. 22.6 kips. All right, um, we've got LB is 15 feet. We've got LP. We need LP in the equation. LP is 6.78 feet, 7.8. Um, we're also missing something. We're missing CB. Now, remember... Um, we can come, we can go through the math and compute CB if you want, but let's re let's recognize, let's remember, it's a pretty simple case. This is a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, and there's bracing at the ends and at mid span. Well, we've had a homework where we look at this problem. Um, does anybody know what CB is or where we can find the CB term for this uh, for this problem? Table 3-1, and it's exactly right. Uh, well, that is 1.3. And so, Table 3-1, or 3-1, sorry, 3-1. 3-1. Okay, so now we're ready to go ahead and start plugging and chugging. So the way that I typically do this is I just compute this upper row first. So CB, B, MPX minus B, 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 F times LB minus LP. Now, one thing to note about zone two, all of the fee values are already built in. So you don't need to go out of your way and multiply by 0.9, but you do in zone three, and that, that'll become clear here in a second. So... 1.3 times, and then this is 750 
minus 22.6 times 15 feet minus 6.78 feet. So somebody tell me what that comes out to be. I got an answer for me. 733.5. So 733.5 foot tips. That's exactly right. So therefore, PMN is the minimum of CB times V. MPX. So PB is uh, or PMN is the minimum of all of that. Or BMP. Remember, I don't care what you compute, you always cut it off at MP. So the minimum of 733.5 foot tips or Seven fifty, and uh, obviously that's seven thirty-three. So, BMN. So here I'll, I'll put the subscript. BMN is seven thirty-three point five foot kips, and if you look at our previous step. We got the MU was 708.75. What does that mean? We're good. We have an adequate capacity. So adequate capacity. Now, I hope everybody still has their table 3-2 um, open because I'm now going to ask, what's this? Three fifteen, and then VU from above. If you remember, we got a VU of what was that? Ninety four point five, and so we're good here as well. And so we've done moment, we've done shear. The last thing we have to do is deflection. And uh, another nice thing about deflection or about table 3-2 is in order to compute deflection, you need the moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia is listed in table 3-2. So you can actually get a lot of stuff from table 3-2 and you don't have to flip around a lot. It makes your life a lot easier. Um, I'm going to leave this up for a sec, see if anybody uh, needs to catch up. But while we're waiting, can somebody tell me what is the moment of inertia of a W24 by 76? Twenty-one hundred. Twenty-one hundred. There you go. Inches to the fourth. 
There you go. All right. Good stuff. Okay. If I need to scroll back up or anything, don't hesitate to let me know if I'm going too fast. I, 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 I'm, we got plenty of time. So now let's look at our deflections. So we did moment, we did shear. Let's do deflections. So first thing we need to compute is the deflection on the beam. This is a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, so the deflection is is the following, just 5WL to 4 over 384EI. By now, we should be pretty comfortable with, uh, with this type of expression. So on the top, 5, and then the distributed load was 3 kips per foot. Um, L was 30 foot to the fourth, then 384. E, you better remember E for steel, that's 29,000. And then the moment of inertia, you said, was 2100 inches to the fourth. And then also, don't forget. that and so somebody tell me what you're getting for this And maybe while we're doing that, I'll say note here on the bottom. Just to say it's on there. 0 0.898 inches. That is what I got. So... 0 0.898 inches. Now, we have to compare that against the uh, maximum permissible deflection. So you can call that delta max or delta allowable, whatever you want to call it. We'll say delta max. Actually, no, let's call it delta allowable. Delta allowable. And the problem stated that that needed to be a limit of L over 360. Now, a couple people were doing this on the homework. They would say L is 30 foot over 360 but don't forget you got to compare apples to apples so you have to multiply that by 12 because you want that to be in inches so 30 times 12 is 360 divided by 360 that's one inch so we have a live load deflection of 0 0.898 inches and then an allowable deflection of one inch and so what does that mean? Are we good or no good? We're good. There you go. So meets deflection limits. So we have a beam that has adequate moment capacity. It has adequate shear capacity. And it meets deflection limits. And that's it. That that would be the analysis of a discreetly braced beam. Again, why don't we account for the dead load when we're doing the deflection check? That's a great question. Um, a couple of things about that. So first off, um, if we go to oh, you go away. If we go to the problem statement, um, hold on, my my mouse is going. If we go to the, um, the, oh, I'm, I'm hitting the wrong button. I'm sorry. Hold on.
So the first answer to that question is because of the problem statement. The problem stated that the limit is a live load deflection limit. So we're so we're only looking at the live load. In steel design, your deflection limits are specified by the client. It's not like concrete design where we have, you know, immediate live load deflection limits and then total deflection limits where we look at everything. It's it's not as code driven uh, in, in steel design as it is in concrete design. So typically your deflection limits would be specified by the client. So for me, I'm just going to tell you what it is in the problem. So I told you live load. Now, to answer your question a little bit further, uh, when you're, you're checking deflections in steel design, more often than not, they are live load deflection limits and not total deflection limits because we can get around the dead load deflection with camber. Okay, so let me give you an example. Um, let me go back to the screen. Okay, so I computed a live load deflection limit of 0 0.898. Now I can go ahead and tell you real quick. Let me see something. The dead load deflection for this beam is probably going to be something about 0.37 inches. Okay, so let's just say that that's the answer. Let's just say that, that if I compute the dead load deflection, it's 0.37 inches. We can get around uh, dead load deflection with something called camber and basically what we're doing in camber is if the dead load is going to cause it to bend downwards 0.37 inches we just physically permanently bend the beam upwards 0.37 inches I said 3.7 it's 0.37 so we would physically bend the beam up permanently uh, uh, 0.37 inches we call that cambering the idea is that when you're constructing the building or constructing the bridge or what have you uh, the camber is going to cause the, the, the beam to sort of curve upward. But once you place it down and place all the wet concrete and all that stuff on top of it, once the dead load is applied, it sits flat. And so cambering sort of neglects the, the, the dead load deflection. You can sort of subtract that out of the equation. So the deflection limits are a function of only the, the occupancy, the live load. Uh, did that answer, did that make sense? And that, I mean, I mean, anybody else have any questions? This is good stuff. Any other questions before we move on? Because I want to, I want to uh, say something about this example, and then I want to get into our second example uh, real quick. All right, let me pull up the the second example. Uh, but before I do that, I want I want to say a note on the analysis. So let me go to this. Okay, so I, I want to take a, a second and talk about something that we did on this example with MU. Okay, I just said MU is WL squared over eight, and I kind of just did that, and I didn't really talk about it. Um, each of these segments are symmetric, okay? What does your moment diagram look like? Like it, it should be a parabola and it curves downward and it peaks in the middle and it peaks at that middle brace and that peak is WL squared over eight. So if you look at your CB calculation for each brace, and we can talk about this because you all did this on a homework assignment recently, you should recognize that the maximum moment occurs at the same place for both segments and it's the same value. So both segments have the same M max and have the same CB value and they have the same unbraced length. So we only just looked at one segment. Well, what if we had a scenario that looked like this and I came up with something that looks kind of crazy. Uh, this is probably outside the realm of what could really happen in, or what would really happen in, in, in real life structural engineering. But there are situations where different segments might have different scenarios. So let's just take this example as a, as a discussion point. So if we look at this segment, this segment has three unbraced lengths. There's an LB1, an LB2, and an LB3. And it, it doesn't matter what, what the numbers are, like LB1 could be 15 feet, LB2 could be 20, LB3 could be 12, it, it doesn't matter. But what we have here is a scenario where each segment has a unique LB value, okay? 
each segment, be, look at the loads. The loads are all over the place. So because the loads are all over the place, each segment is going to have a unique LB. It's going to have a unique CB. Each segment is going to have a unique maximum moment. And also each segment, because of all that, they are going to have a unique VMN. So the beam is just not going to have a, a VMN value of something. Each segment is going to have its own VMN value. So if you had a beam like this where it's all over the place, you would have to compute VMN for, for each segment. And so you would look at what, what you would really have to look at from a capacity standpoint is that efficiency, you know, the maximum load, the maximum factored moment divided by the maximum or divided by the factored resistance. And you would look at that efficiency for each segment and find which efficiency was largest and that would govern the design. See, it's possible that, let's say, segment one, segment one might have a larger capacity than segment two, but it's not so much the capacity, it's the comparison between the load and the capacity. So you would compute the efficiency for each of those three segments and, and take the one with the highest efficiency. That's going to control uh, your design. Now, that's what you would do for moments. For shears, just look at the shear diagram and take the maximum shear overall. And for deflections, just use the maximum deflection that you find along the entire beam and compare that against your L over 360 or, or, or whatever. Again, even with scenarios like this, shears shouldn't be a problem. I mean, look at the problem we just did. We had a load of 94 kips, but the beam could hold up over 300 kips. Shears just tend to not be a problem uh, in, in steel beam design. Does that make sense? And does anybody have any questions before we move on to the next example? All right. Let's look at our second uh, analysis example. So this is another discreetly braced example. And I'm not interested in doing all the, the structural analysis and the moments, the shears and deflections and all that stuff. I just want to look at computing VMN. And I want to compute VMN for a W14 by 61. Now, I want to look here at this note on the bottom of the slide. Okay, It says here, a W14 by 61 is not one of the bold rows in table 3-2. Okay, There's a reason why we're looking at a section that's not a bold row. Okay, And the reason why is in continuously braced beam design, we would always go with the bold row. But for discreetly braced beam design, we're going to use a different design aid that we'll talk about on Monday. And what you get out of that design aid may not necessarily match the the uh, the bold row section in table 3-2. So I want you to get comfortable with finding a section in table 3-2 that's not bolded. Okay, So I want you to find the W14 by 61. And what I want everybody to do is I want you to first tell me what is LR for W14 for a W14 by 61. And we'll use that as a test to make sure that everybody can find it. We're looking for LR for a, a W14 by 61. Twenty-seven point five. That's a good eye. Uh, if you go to page three dash twenty-five uh, of the manual, so let me scroll up a bit. Uh, share. So I'm uh, on page three dash twenty-five, and so it should look like this in your manual. If you scroll down to the very, very bottom. You should see where it says the W21 by 48, and then drop two, two rows below that, and you'll see a W14 by 61, and it's not bolded, okay? And so if you look over here on the right, it says uh, uh, LR is um, uh, the 27.5 there on the very bottom, okay? So the reason why I, I'm, I wanted to show that is because I want to go back to the slide, uh, So we, we're going to determine the design capacity of a W14 by 61, 
A992 steel is utilized. The unbraced length is 30 feet. So if LR is 27.5 feet and um, uh, uh, LB is 30 feet, what zone are we in? Zone 1, Zone 2, or Zone 3? Uh, I have another typo. I did it again. We're in zone three. Uh, I did it again. It's whenever your LB is bigger than LR, it's in zone three. I'm sorry. That's what happens when you're rushing through. Whenever your LB is greater than LR, you're in zone three. I think you did. You saw the same thing. Yeah, that, let me screen cap that and I'll, I'll give me a second. I'm sorry about that. So let me um, let me go back to the notebook. So that I'm I'm sorry. That's supposed to say LB. LB is greater than LR. Sorry about that. Now, in order to do this problem, okay, so we're going to have to do two sets of calculations. So, so let should be clear. LB is 30 foot and LR is 27.5 foot. So we are definitely past LR and we're in zone three. In order to compute this, we're going to need a couple of values. One of the values we're going to go ahead and get from table three, two is FMP. What is FMP for this section? Somebody tell me what fee and P is. That should be in table 3-2 for the W14 by 61. Remember, it's a, it's a W14 by 61. 383. All right. Okay. Now, unfortunately, there's no nifty analysis aid to really help us with this. We kind of have to chug it out. So I'm going to help you out with that a little bit. Um, what everybody to do is I want everybody to go to table 1-1, one -one, and I need four properties. Because if you look at, I mean, I'm not just picking these out of the sky. If you look at the equation, you can see I'm going to need them. I'm going to need the following four properties. I'm going to need RTS. I'm going to need H0. I'm going to need uh, J. And I'm going to need SX. So I want everybody to go to table 1-1. And I'm going to, uh, I, want, uh, I want those four values. Let's start off with RTS. So if you go to table 1-1, one, one, it's going to, these are going to be on the right page, the page on the right, and uh, the listings for the W14 by 61. While I'm at it, I'm also going to go ahead and remind everybody for this problem, uh, CB was given to us, and it's 1.5. I apologize if I go a little bit over. I'm going to try and go through this somewhat quickly. But I want to make sure everybody can find this. 2.78, there we go. All right, so this is 2.78 inches. Real quick, can somebody give me H naught? There we go. J, real quick. Two point one nine, and that's inches to the fourth. And SX.
92.1. There we go. All right. So let me show you how this works. Okay, I'm going to scroll up here a little bit. So the first thing that we compute is FCR, and FCR is CB pi squared E. Then we take LB over RTS, square it. 1 minus 0 0.078 JC over SXH naught. And then LB over RTS squared. And so don't worry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you all out with this one. So first off, oh, I don't know why I did that. So CB was given, that's 1.5. Pi squared was given, or pi squared wasn't given, pi, I mean, it's pi squared. Uh, this is 29,000 KSI. Now, I'm going to change my font here real quick because I want to show you something. LB for this problem was 30 feet, right? Well, this needs to be 360 inches, okay? And I, I'm, I really want to indicate that because you're dividing by 2.78 inches, okay? So make sure you convert your LB to inches so that inches over inches. 1 minus 0 0.078 and then we've got um we got a fraction here this is um 2.19 inches to the fourth this is 1.0 this is 92.1 inches to the third this is 13.3 inches Again, C is 1. And then again, don't forget, 360 inches. Don't forget to convert that to inches when you're in zone 3. All right. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and chug this for you. You ought to practice this out to make sure that you're comfortable with this. The, the number comes out to be 46.779, okay? Now, as for the units, if you look at the equation, if you look at everything under, let's say, the square root, you have inches to the fourth on the top and then inches to the fourth on the bottom. You have inches on the top, inches on the bottom. The only thing that drives the units is actually your E value, the whatever E is in, because everything else cancels. So this is actually in KSI. Okay, All right. Next thing that you do is you compute phi FCR SX. So phi is 0 0.9, FCR is 46.779 KSI, and SX is 92.1. And so this is 38. 77.51 inch kips or 323.16 foot kips. Remember, uh, phi and P was 383. And so VMN is the minimum of VB, FCR, SX, or VMP. I apologize for this going a little fast, but I want to make sure that we get this part finished.
I'm going to give everybody a sec on, and then I'm going to pull up your homework. I want to see if anybody has any questions on that. I know I went through it a little fast. Where do we get the C value? C is one for W shapes. It's a constant. The reason it's it's there is if you're ever looking at like a channel instead of an uh, an I shape, if you're looking at a channel, C changes. But for I, I'm only interested in W shapes with everything going on. We're not going to look at anything else. Any other quick questions? All right, uh, let me pull up the homework real quick just to show you. Um, the homework more revolves around, I'll go ahead and tell you, it revolves more around the second example we did than the first, or it should. Um, but regardless of which example it revolves around, it should be pretty easy. Um, uh, just tell me what FMN is for that segment. If LB is 15 feet and CB is one. So, you know, you go into table three dash two. Um, I'll be honest. I kind of just picked a random shape and picked a random LB. Um, so I'm pretty sure which zone it's in, but um, I just randomly picked one. But that's actually kind of, was kind of the point. I want to make sure that, that you all can determine whether or not it's zone one, zone two, or zone three. I'm going to update those slides uh, for those LP, uh, LB, LP typos so that it's all consistent. I apologize for that. That's what happens when you are trying to rush the notes. I, I totally reformatted the notes from last year to try and condense the number of slides so you're not having to flip through hundreds of slides. And so that's what happens when you're scrambling to get it done before class. I apologize. Um, any quick questions before we call it? Uh, hold on. Where is the trick? Like that? Again, these terms just come from table one one. Any other questions? Oh, and, and to answer your question, John, you can see right there the C value. I put that on the flow chart. Right there. Anything else? All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I apologize for keeping y'all over a little bit longer, but I really wanted to get through these examples. On Monday, we're going to look at design and uh, and, and and how that uh, is handled. Uh, that's all I got, everybody. I will see you all on Monday. Y'all have a wonderful weekend.